I mean, we could stand toe to toe with everybody else once we <laughs> finish the five miler of death. So, <laughs> you were saying you know that guy, don't you? Everyone knows that guy. Am I, I am. I'm not plugging the guy. Uh, yeah, but as you, as as Raf Reg, yeah, I thought no, it wasn't you that knew him personally. The five miler. It was Bags. Bags. Bags' his business partner knows him personally. Yeah. What are well, uh, congratulations for being the first Raf Reg guy on the podcast, by the way. <laughs> Thanks, and sir. um What do you think of the five mile death? Um well th- that that whole thing is just total bullshit. It's like the, the so the last day of your live field firing, you you do a march to where you start start the range. So it's just like it's it's just a normal morning's fizz and then that video turned into this like absolute monstrosity that's going to haunt the Raf Reg for the next hundred years, unless it gets disbanded in the next ten, which it may well do. Uh, so there is no five mile of death. No. Why did he say that? I have no idea. <laughs> like the, it's it just boggles my mind because you you have uh, the, the last part of your training's field gunners, and the last day is the like flight attack or platoon attack um so it's it's just another another day on the range there's no like this is the big final march of your training or anything like that it's just walk to the range and and go and throw grenades at things it's yeah th- there is no five miler of death and there definitely isn't now after that <laughs> and the weird thing is <laughs> i mate, the weird thing is about this is that because he said that and that video came out yeah. i thought that the Rafreg must have a five miler as part of their like p- selection process, or whatever. And but there's not. Yeah. And now, but no. th- loads of people now think they must be. They must have a five miler or something. Yeah. No, it's not part of the. It's nothing to do with it at all. Um, how long did you ser- How long did you serve Rafreg? Uh, so, just short of six years. So five and a half years, really. So I joined um, when I was seventeen, two thousand and seven, and then left. Like 2012, early 2000, yeah, late 2012. How did you find it? Uh, I think depending on when you joined, you had a very different experience. So I, I did two Afghan tours, um, and because of the type of work that I was doing, I think my experience is probably very different to lots of other people. So I mean, I spent a lot of time on that. Um, and obviously, I don't really know anyone that came off that job in quite the same mental state that went onto it. So it's, um, yeah, I think in the Rough Reg, you could have a very easy time or a very difficult time, depending on when you join. For us, it was probably quite a difficult time, really. So for, for, your, <coughs> so for your entire time on both tours in Afghan, you you was, you did it almost entirely on the medical medical evacuation response team, right? MERT. Um, I did a, I did. A lot of time on it, but not, you know, not the whole thing. So we we would rotate through different jobs. But on my first tour in 2009, we went out as like a forward. There was a, one flight of us went out early. Um, <clears throat> and because we were the first people to start doing MERT, it then became, or the first Ref Reg people to start doing MERT, um, it then became sort of easier to keep those same people <clears throat> on there for a lot longer because we'd done more medical training. We'd spent more time with the the crew and things that so just sort of made sense to put those th- people back on again. And then that carried on on the second tour as well. Um, but we'd, we'd rotate. So, um, you know, you, you do how many days? I can't even remember, like eight days on Mert or something. And then you go out and do uh, test roll patrols and like patrols where you we had an AO around Bastion that we'd go out, which touched the like got to the edge of Nad Alley, but nowhere really worse than that, to be honest. Um, so those patrols were pretty benign. You'd like drive around occasionally, you get blown up. And we didn't lose one guy from an ID, but um, most of those patrols were pretty benign. But then you'd go on Mert and it was like the complete opposite end of that. You you know, every time you get on the helicopter, you're flying to the worst place in Southern Afghanistan, um, which at first is pretty entertaining. Um, but then it pretty quickly, you know, reality sets in. Yeah, we did uh, when uh, in 2006 when we went that tour, and it was just just three pair there. Obviously, the Atsindet supporters, <coughs> we would man that. 
So, yeah. but but as you said, it was it just fell to whoever the, was the was the unit in Baskin at the time because we, as much as we could, we would try and rotate in and out of. Uh, we, we would try and rotate through areas. Obviously, some places it wasn't possible. Um, but they were trying for respite for reasons you can't keep no matter what the job you, it's not it's not um, very good for your mental health but in, in anything I'm not just in the military you're doing the same job day in day out right um, exactly. and uh, particularly when we're talking about arduous tasks uh, and I, the it wasn't called the it was it called the Mer, was it called the Mer in 06 so oh. there, there was IRT which was Immediate response to it was IRT. Then, yeah. It was like we call it. We call it IRT. I I, it might have been a move at the time. Either way, I rotated through, and I didn't realize. So it makes sense, though. If it makes sense for that task to fall as the as the troops in Afghan got bigger, it makes sense for that task to fall to whoever whatever unit is sort of um, IC Camp Bastion, doesn't it? Um, what was what was so mentally challenging about it? Um, that's probably quite a big question, actually. You're a big um, boy. You're a big boy. Can handle it. So, I think you know you, it's just like being a paramedic or anything. You're seeing really, really traumatic scenes day in, day out, um, and the majority of it you can kind of distance yourself from because it's just you know you look at a body as like a car. It's like which bit's broken? Like where's the oil coming from? We'll stop it. Um, but then occasionally you'll get something like, you know, you, you'll see someone who's, um, their, you know, their, their boots aren't issue. So you'd now think that person had to go into a shop and decided he wanted those boots. And so then you instantly put a character to that body. And then, you know, and that's when it becomes a lot more difficult. Picking up civilians was really difficult as well. Um, picking up special forces I found difficult because you'd look at a person who's like dedicated their entire life to being, you know, the best soldier they can be. And they are like incredibly fit at the absolute pinnacle of what they're capable of as a, as a human being. And then they're just blown to pieces and all of that work is undone. So that was very difficult to, to see as well. Um, so yes, yeah, seeing anyone in a really bad state is never a pleasant experience. Um, but when you've got people that started here, like that morning, they woke up and they were here. And now for the next five years, they're going to be, well, like minimum five years, if they survive, they're going to be right down here. So like seeing, seeing like people's, you know, it's the, every time the radio would go, it would be the worst day of someone else's life. And, you know, once that gets into your head, it becomes very difficult to then shake it. And, you know, Mert goes from being this kind of cool job, flying into firefights, getting shot at, saving saving lives, to then just being like, oh, I've got to see it again. And every time the radio goes, it's like, oh, fuck, okay, someone else has, like, lost their legs or whatever. And the other, the other thing that would, because we would rotate and one day we were out on patrols and the next day we were in the back of a helicopter watching people that had been blown up and shot. When you go back out on the patrol, you're thinking like, that could be me. Um, and so it, there's loads of different levels. And even though the, the area that we were working in was pretty um, relatively safe in comparison to what guys were doing in the, in the green zone, um, it still was quite difficult to sort of deal with. Well, I I found I'm sure there were other people that were better than me and other people that were worse than me, but um, it's difficult to deal with. Yeah, I can imagine. I hadn't. It's uh, I hadn't. It's something I hadn't thought about before like that. Uh, and so I'm thinking about that repetition of the activity, uh, and I was sort of not comparing it, but I was realising it's when when you're on a most of my time I was you know in patrol bases and stuff like that and on the tours I did, and uh, and you sort of have the same. Thing. you know it's like man you've got to go back out there it's a nightmare but what's different I think to what you're talking about the medical evacuation stuff is that every single time you go out it's because someone's in clip you know uh, and when you go out on patrol you don't get a casualty every time you get depending where you are you get a lot of you know casualties yeah. frequently but you don't get it every time and you know 
on the second and third tours onwards, he wouldn't necessarily get shot at every time either. Um, so they have to go out and deal with that. Uh, yeah, that must be hideous. It's something I would not like to do, especially when you start. One of the things we do, I think, when we uh, people do is when they have that the experience like c- c- catastrophe. Um, whether you were there when the catastrophe happened or you're in the aftermath of it, is we, I think. One of the things we do is we, we quite often de- try and dehumanise things and then you get you know, the disassociation and stuff like that, the more, more extreme ends of it. But when you start then being able to relate to the person who's in tatters, like you said, different got an Ali set of boots on. Exactly. I like Ali boots. He's like me, you know, yeah. or, uh, you know, pretty, even as small as he's got a, he's a British, British soldier. Yeah. You know, that uh, makes it, must have made it very difficult. Yeah, I remember uh, during Panther's Claw and all the Panchai Palang mess in, when was that, 2009? Um, one of the, we picked up, so we had two helicopters running, um, two Chinooks, and, you know, we were basically just constant, like we were overtaking, like passing each other in the sky, um, just picking up groups of casualties after groups of casualties. And I remember there was one guy who, uh, I, I'm not entirely sure what had happened to him, probably involved in a huge ID with the rest of the, you know, the bodies all over the place in the helicopter. And I remember talking to him and he was into motocross. And I, you know, I'm not into motocross, but I'm into downhill biking. And at the time I was racing downhill bikes. So we had this story about how he was going to, we were talking about how he was going to spend his PAX insurance on a new motocross bike. And, you know, because you're having that conversation, he was actually, I mean, I'm sure he's, He's fine, um, based on his injuries. I, I don't. I mean, I hope he didn't have anything lasting. Um, but yeah, when you start having those conversations, you yeah instantly humanise people. Um, yeah. How did you, as it went on? Because um, you you spoke openly in the past about with me anyway about the impact it had on you. Um, when did you get out? Uh, so I left. Uh, I think it was mid 2012 it kind of all a bit of that whole time was a bit of a blur to be honest oh you um, yeah you left not long after me i left sort of yeah september 2011 yeah okay so i i finished my second tour spring 2011 and then and maybe it was later 2012 anyway um it might have even been early 2013 thinking about it but yeah i mean i, I had a weekend between leaving the Air Force and starting with the BBC, so it was a bit, bit mad. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I suffered with complex PTSD for quite a long time, and it, it was always one of those things that never really, you don't really realise that you're suffering with it, and you just think I had an episode when I was drunk, but maybe I'm just drinking too much. Um, and fortunately, I was in a, you know, good enough life position where I was just like I'm drinking too much I'll stop drinking so I did but then the symptoms didn't go to work, go away um, and then you know you throw yourself into work so that distracts you uh, but then something happens with work and all of a sudden you you know all the bedrock you had that you were surviving on you fall through and then you you fucked um, so yeah I was I think I think most of the like mental damage was done in uh, the 2009 tour and then doing the same thing again 2010 11 i know on that tour i wasn't i wasn't myself um and then afterwards i just continued to get sort of more and more intense until um 2015 after so i was involved in the i was on everest during the earthquake and avalanche and stuff um i have a load of people i was with died and after that, I was kind of flavor of the month in the BBC for a little while. But when that went away, all of a sudden you've got not only all the Afghan stuff, but then this like surviving a huge earthquake and avalanche on Mount Everest. So then you've got that as well. And it, it became pretty apparent that I was either going to have to deal with it or lose my job in the BBC. So um, I dealt with it. Explain the Everest thing to me. <laughs> uh, so... I was, I mean, this is a kind of slightly longer story, actually. Um, So one of the things I was doing with the BBC was uh, tracking down uh, jihadists. So I was, um, (laughs) 
finding British jihadist fighters in Syria and then trying to interview them. Um, I was actually pretty good at that. Uh, I had a whole a list of a list of people. We followed people in Syria. The Shamina Begum. We followed her across Turkey and into Syria, and ended up like with her dad in a in an apartment in Gaziantep and all sorts. It was an interesting time. Um, I found yeah the last job I did uh, before Everest was uh, tracking down Jihadi John's dad in Kuwait. And we, we secretly filmed in the former employer of Jihadi, like Jihadi John's former employer's office, um, shook the hand of his dad, uh, went to where he used to live in the Bidoon community in Q8. Um, and to get a bit of respite from all of that, I thought, you know, this we basically set up a BBC bureau on Mount Everest. And I thought it's a nice, relaxing, kind of adventurous thing to do, uh, just you know, do a bit of climbing. Maybe I've always, I've climbed since I was 16. So like, you know, thought I'd do a little bit of climbing, but nothing, nothing too crazy and just live at base camp, hang out, um, follow the story of Everest and, you know, make some nice films. And then, uh, yeah, on the, the, uh, sort of end of April, we were doing our, our first rotation, which is where you, um, go up to like, you spend a night in camp one, up to camp two and it's like the first stage of your acclimatization um and originally i wasn't supposed to supposed to go on it i had like a load of bbc work i had to um catch up on at base camp and i thought i'll just i'll not bother and then at like 3 a.m heard everyone's climbing gear jingling i thought oh, fuck it i fancy a climb um so i uh went with the team up through the ice wall um and just as we got to camp one there was uh, everything like the so Camp One is on a glacier and it's the top of the ice wall. So it's where the glacier kind of goes off like a off a cliff basically and splits open and you end up with all these crevasses and things, which is what the ice wall is. So we're kind of suspended between two crevasses in Camp One and the whole camp is like that. And most of the time it's totally safe and, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, Camp One's not, it's not exactly what you consider safe, but comparatively in climbing, it's pretty safe. Um, and everything started shaking and we had like probably five meters visibility. Um, so I was thinking like, this is, you know, I've never been in avalanche before. It was like, well, maybe the ground just shakes and avalanches. And then the ground shook to the point where I basically fell over. Um, and it started like going up and down as well as side to side. And then I realized we were probably fucked. Um, looked over at the face of one of the really experienced um, climbers, Rolf, and his uh, climbing partner, Joe. And they were like, Rolf was like, uh, what did he say? I think he he just said like, this is it then. And like, if someone that's that experienced in climbing is saying this is it, then I was pretty confident that was it. Um, so I, I was absolutely sure I was dead. Uh, I climbed into the tent press record on on the camera and just sat on the floor and waited to die um uh so so you were you were sitting above what you were above a massive drop yeah and the tent was it, oh, this, why is that? the tent was um suspended on a, a platform how so, many of you on the, how many of you on the platform um so the way camp one sort of works is you have like ridges um and between the ridges chances are there's a crevasse because it's where the glacier opens so there's like um, rows of tents on the top of these ridges with crevasses in between and there's safe there's safe bridges and ice, uh, ice bridges and safe ways to walk between them um, so uh, in camp one I think there's about I can't remember exactly there's probably there's more than more than 100 people there um, other climbers I mean Everest is is a busy place and that was like that was the first day that everybody decided to climb yeah. Um, so it was it was busy, um, but on you know in our team the tents are really spread out though. So you know that you're probably talking like a, a kilometer from um, <clears throat> one row of tents and the f like the highest tents and the lowest tents kind of thing. So you're really spread out. So in our in our little bit for our team there were I know, if I took a bit longer I could work out exactly how many but probably seven eight mm -hmm. with another few people that were just slightly slower through the ice fall so they were they were on their way up um 
So yeah. What happened? What do you think about when you wait when you're sitting there? This is the only time. This is the thing with this fight. I can or I can sort of relate to. I can sort of relate to this. The feeling I reckon. Um, the only time I've ever been, I felt fear when I was serving was when it was a situation where I couldn't do anything about it. And I'm literally like, oh my God, this could be out. And it was with a mate of Michael Jared, right? He used to host a podcast with me. And uh, we were under under fire from mortars. And at the point, I've explained it before, but there was nothing to do about it. At that point, there was zero we could do about it. And it's the most horrendous feeling I've ever had. Not being able to do anything about it. How was it for you? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yeah, uh, your facial expression is pretty much how it was. Um, yeah, you. It's an odd feeling because you, you know, I wasn't scared at all. I, nah, I in in one sense, I was petrified. Like, be, uh, you kind of go beyond fear. It's like you you've you've gone past fear. You know, you're petrified, but that doesn't really count anymore because there's uh, so much other shit going on. And I just felt really disappointed in myself. It was like, why? You know, because I, you know, my, I've got a. I'm very fortunate in that I have a lot of people that really care about me, family-wise. Um, and I knew that by me dying in such a stupid situation, um, I've ruined their lives. So it was like, I didn't. I didn't need to climb. Like Everest is a fucking pointless exercise. It's like completely an exercise in massaging your own ego um so what the fuck am i doing here and like i'm gonna die for the sake of massaging my ego and just because i fancied a climb this morning um so i was just embarrassed to be honest it's like i just felt really really stupid um and yeah so you you've passed fear and at the point of just feeling like an idiot well, mate, you're feeling like that because you're a good person. I mean, you, when you when you're about to spank in, and what you're thinking of is other people's feelings. I mean, it says a lot about your character. You don't think about that, you know. Uh, um, what were, what was I going to say then? Uh, oh God, no, I can't remember. What the bloody hell was it? Oh no, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I think in those kind of situations, again, catastrophe. catastrophe the, what people do around you as well is a big factor. I mean, you see people screaming and panic. It's contagious in like situation where nothing's happened. And, and you know, you're sitting with a bunch of experienced climbers and they're calm and you don't want it to be calm. Well, you, you know, it's, uh, you don't freak out. It's, yeah, it's, um, yeah. it probably quite a rare scenario as well. You can actually, you've got time to contemplate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'd rather not have that. No, I, I'm not sure I would either, but. Um, it's nice to have had that and not had to die. I mean, that's that's a positive. What what happened? Tell me, talk me through what happened. Um, so we, uh, because of the weather, we were basically trapped in camp camp one for uh, two two three days. I can't remember exactly, but I think it was about this, three this is days after the earthquake. Yeah, um, and we uh, there were constant aftershocks. So the earthquake triggered a huge avalanche, um, and the avalanche destroyed base camp, um, killed. Uh, f- well, four, three of our Sherpas and four people that I knew well. Um, and we, you know, we thought it was just something that had affected us, but we quickly realized it was actually a much bigger problem below. And I don't think anyone died in Camp One, um, certainly not from from the avalanche. I mean, maybe, I don't, I don't think anyone I don't think anyone did die in camp one or two, but in base camp, it was not good. Um, How many died in base camp? I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, but I think the fish, it was something like 18, but I counted more bodies than that when I got down. So um, I'd need to, I need to check it. I can, I could Google it. But no, no, I can't no, remember sorry, off the top of my head. Sorry, no. um, enough anyway, enough to make a significant impact. Yeah. I mean, it was fortunate that everyone was climbing, to be honest, because if it had happened the day before, then that the area of base camp, which was, funnily enough, exactly where my camp was, um, that area would have like been full of people, and that area is completely decimated. I mean, it was like a bomb had gone off. My my tent had just evaporated. Um, Your kit was there, still there? Where, where yeah. It- yeah. My, I found Pelicase's 500 metres away, smashed to pieces. 
I took photos to Pelly. Actually, I'd sent photos to Pelly, and they never replaced the cases. Gutted. Um, but but no, I found like bits of equipment smashed to, smashed to pieces all over the place. Um, yeah, everybody that was in our camp died. Um, Henry, the like expedition leader, thankfully he was visiting another friend's um, camp, so he was okay. Um, but yeah, the, I mean the major thing was was in base camp for us. We were uh, well, I mean we, we were trapped there. We couldn't go anywhere. Um, every time there was another, uh, earth, every time there was an aftershock or anything, we'd get um, like avalanched from from above um but they were powder by the time they got to us so it's just like being in a snowstorm um but that was happening probably at, at points every 20 minutes or so um and each time you get a yeah i mean you get into a bit of a rhythm with it um where you you just sort of accept that that's something that's going to happen and every time there's a little aftershock you the fear is there um but it's just something you have to accept and it's not like you can go anywhere um, so we more or less just had to, had to wait. And then we, we were running out of, um, so obviously you need, uh, gas to melt the snow to make water and you don't want to be eating snow cause it just cools you down too much. You get really cold really quickly. Um, especially when you're sitting around doing very little. So we started to run out of, um, gas to, to make water with, and then, uh, we got, got rescued, um, so they were flying helicopters from base camp up to camp one and they were, they could take two people in their bags, take them down and then come back up, two people back down. Um, so we had, I was uh, filming the a Gurkha team um, and there were a couple of guys who were Gurkha and a, a bit more than just Gurkha um, and they were like organizing everything and organizing the rescue. Was, um, yeah, I mean, it was a, there were a lot of people doing a lot of things to try and, get everyone off safely. Um, a bit more than just Gurkha, you mean XF, SF? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Anyone we know? Probably. <laughs> Flipping heck, mate. So you leave the military because of all the death, because you don't like the death dodging and you go to Everest and then the death dodging again. Yeah. And Syria. Well, man. Yeah. Mate, no, one, no, wonder, no wonder the complex PTSD is there. <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, I, I, we can laugh and joke about it because yeah. we, we are. This is a flipping nightmare. Um, how did you deal with that then? How have you how have you got to the point where you are now through that co- complex PTSD? At what point did you realise and how that it was more than just an alcohol issue? So, um, so it was never. I mean, I was fortunate in that it was never really a an issue with. Um, I mean, I, so I mean, I, I knew really early on. Basically, I, I went. Um, this was 2011, just after I got back from the second tour. Um, Things weren't great. And then I went to a nightclub with a really good friend of mine and I had a total meltdown. Um, in what way? I'd basically, I was in the, in the club and then all of a sudden I was in a helicopter um, and I needed to get out. So I like started fighting to get out of the club. Um, found my way to the door eventually. Hallucinating. Well, it's a bit more than... It's, it's difficult to describe because you, you can smell everything... Like aviation fuel was like a hundred percent trigger for me. If I smell aviation fuel instantly, I was like back on a helicopter. So you you have the same emotions you had on the helicopter. You smell the same things, like you can hear the same or the you know the the noises around. You get blurred with like the noises of helicopters and and things and bone drills. Um, so there's all this stuff. Like it's not like you're fully in the nightclub or fully in Afghanistan, you're like wedged between the two, but you 100% believe that you are in absolute peril and all of the emotions you felt in the helicopter, which most of the time was sort of just complete sorrow for the you know poor fucker that you're trying to keep alive. Um, so all of that comes, comes straight back. And I fought my way out of the, out of the nightclub and then I was like, rolling around on the floor in the street in Nottingham, um, which is not like me. Uh, I'm, I hate being out of control. I'm virtually never out of control. Um, and yeah, I was shouting, uh, the name of the only person I knew that we, we didn't even pick him up. A guy called Liam Tasker, who, 
um, was a dog handler, uh, and he he was uh, shot with a sniper, or shot by a sniper, um, or sharpshooter, I should say. Um, and we went to go and pick him up. I I I didn't know him particularly well. He wasn't I wasn't someone I'd consider a like I didn't know him as a friend, but I I knew him. I'd spent a bit of time with the dog section. I knew a few of the dog handlers. So um, so that was a death that kind of the it was almost like he was the uh, person who I attached all these other people to. Um, and so, yeah, I realized there was a, I was with my uh, best friend, Eddie as well. And rather than, you know, Eddie helping out, he he just rolled around on the floor next to me. He was also uh, ex ref Reg, did a tour of Iraq. So he just, he just joined in. <laughs> what, what, do you mean, roll, what were you doing rolling around? What do you mean? Like so, I, I was having my uh, meltdown, and rather than try and like stop people looking or whatever, or like try and you know help me, he just joined in. So there'd be like, you know, he was just joining in with the kind of embarrassment of the situation. So absolute legend. Um, so I realised there was a bit of an issue there, uh, but I thought it was fine. It was something I could just deal with myself. Um, and then it, it started to become every time I drank too much, I'd have these same things. And so my way of dealing with that was to just not drink too much, um, which I know lots of people can't do, but thankfully I could. So I just sort of stopped drinking, started doing lots of exercise and more mountain biking and that kind of kept it at bay for a little while. Um, and then, uh, yeah, then it got to the point where I, I realized I was thinking about it all the time. Um, and I realized that I was hyper vigilant. So I'd be, I'd be in a restaurant or something and I would hear someone drop their fork like from, you know, 50 meters away. And I'd know what table they were sat at and what they'd ordered. And I could hear the waiter talking to someone like a table another way. And your brain is just in overdrive and it's exhausting because you can't, you can't ever switch off. Um, so you just get more and more and more tired. And then when you get tired, you start to get more flashbacks. Uh, so it's it's a bit of a, a spiral down, and I after so I kept it all at bay for quite a while, and then after Everest, I kind of realised my BBC career was going places. Um, I needed to keep that together, and I was at risk of of uh, it all falling apart and losing it. Um, so I went and well, I got a. Uh, I already had a diagnosis for complex PTSD at that point, but I went and got another one and then uh, started therapy um, and did a therapy called EMDR. E EMDR? E I can't remember the exact um, acronym, but it's to do with eye movement. So you recite the stories um, or recite the intrusive memories and then you move your eyes and it's something to do with the... Yeah, I'm not even going to try and get into the technical detail, but it it worked incredibly well for me and we found um we found the sort of major incident that caused the whole thing and once we'd dealt with that and it was incredibly traumatic and hard like reciting that over and over and over again and reliving that same thing over again um but i just i realized that i you know if i put 100 percent of myself into it really deal with the therapy go all in do everything i possibly can to get better then i knew it would work and it did um and since then i've not had a single since i finished the therapy i've not had a single symptom like nothing mega um so for anyone who's like listening to this or watching this and is suffering go and do therapy because you know I, I'd be I was a, I was a shell before um and now I feel you know myself again yeah I, I we were talking before the podcast about um number 99 Mandy Mandy Bostwick yeah <clears throat> and uh one of the things well, it was specifically related to TBI and uh and she was basically one of the issues that came up with the with the psychiatry side of things at Imperial College. And I mentioned that the report that was sort of doctored and bits that omitted and all that was um, was that what they were trying to say is some. And it's obviously not the case with yourself, but with some 
some uh, some form some PTSD or a lot of PTSD in terms of military is caused by traumatic brain injuries and it's a symptom of right uh, and therapy has a place there it can be used to treat it but one of the things she was saying is that on the, the first thing you look at and one of the things that even assessing is the we were talking the physio the, the neurophysiology side yeah. of things um, and and uh, and it's, I'm, I'm glad we ran this conversation because one of the things that came out of that podcast and one of the things, things I think got, got not misconstrued, um, well, that people may have sort of taken from it is that therapy has no place. Um, which it, it does, absolutely does. And, uh, but uh, they feel so strongly about the neurophysiology side of things that it was sort of, it was communicated in a bit of a, a, not a poor way, just, it was just the way it went. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm glad we have this conversation because there is a place for therapy, man. I'm sort of flipping mega. It, it, it worked for me. I'm glad you're in a, in a, in a much better place. Uh, how, why did the, um, how did, the, how did Dust Off come about? How did Dust Off films come about then? Um, so I, uh, so at the end of my BBC career, um, going to be a bit, careful here but i i had a a job in uh, the bbc world affairs unit that i really i loved i was a video journalist i was traveling all over the place um making you know what my job was basically to go to places where there's breaking news and tell the kind of side story um so i would be with a correspondent and a camera operator um but i would be looking for for an extra story there or an extra film to make to, you know, predominantly for the website and online content. And I love that job. I was working with like the best people I've ever worked with. Like the producers were incredible. The correspondents were incredible. Camera operators were just the best in the world. Um, and when I was uh, doing the therapy, um, my job basically evaporated. Um, so I, obviously I was concentrating on getting better. So I didn't notice that my job was basically being, um, removed from the world affairs unit. Um, and so, uh, I wanted to, uh, move out of that and go into, so, so one of the, one of the things that the world affairs unit gave me was enough time to be able to do proper investigations and really get to the bottom of what the story was. So I did an investigation that lasted probably, uh, well, just over a year where I've followed, um, with the help of a guy called Nick Jensen Jones, who's a weapons expert, really good guy. Um, we followed a rifle from a factory in Belgium, um, to Gaddafi's like shock troops through the Libyan civil war. And then it ended up with uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza. So uh, Quentin Somerville, the correspondent, he went to interview PIJ and they showed him one of the, one of the weapons that was from this original shipment. We had shipping documents in that we got uh, from Libya. Um, and we managed to track this rifle from factory, like through legitimate arms trade, and then interviewed the people that handled the weapon through the Libyan civil war and then all the way through tunnels into, you know, Gaza. Um, and that made me realize that documentaries and long form stuff is where I wanted to be. I could do that in the, in the world affairs unit. So I would have kept doing that if I had the opportunity. Um, but that opportunity didn't exist anymore. So I wanted to go into documentaries. Um, and I realized that all the, all the the types of documentaries that I really wanted to get into if uh, done by freelancers. Um, so I uh, joined the uh, news gathering camera unit. So I got taught by some very good camera operators in the BBC. Um, and after like six months of mentoring with them, I realized that like setting up my own independent documentary production company um, and going independent was the way to go. Um, I got, uh, there was a, this amazing guy called, uh, Frank O'Keefe, who is trying to save the planet at the moment. 
um, literally trying to save the planet, he's worth Googling. Um, he bought me uh, my first set of camera equipment um, and then that was it. So it's been, what, three and a half years now. We're now working with um, uh, Diamond Docs, who are a production company based in LA that have won two Oscars. Um, we're working on a number of films together. We're working with the UN on a film in Mozambique. Um, I go to Kenya in two days' time to uh, a film with the Rangers in um, the Barana Conservancy, which is part of a, a really big project. It's the first first part of a very big project, hopefully. Uh, we've got some really good investors involved in that as well and some very interesting and interested people who hopefully will push it you know, more into the, into the public eye. Um, so yeah, the things with dust off is going very well. That's mega, mate. It's mega. Um, is that in the Africa stuff with, uh, veterans for wildlife? Uh, so I'm through a friend of mine. We're trying to get in touch with veterans for wildlife. Um, I'll just realized, you, I'll yeah, put, I'll I was going to say, uh, Jim, Jim Glancy on the podcast yeah. twice. I'll, put in, I'll, I'll, I'll drop my line. Yeah, that would be, that yeah, would be yeah. awesome. Don't, don't have to list, remind me, mate. My memory is terrible. We don't have to list, definitely. Yeah, but there's loads of stuff out there. Um, I know that I'll be back on again soon. Yeah. yeah. What well, Diamond Docs. So what, yeah. what did Diamond Docs get the Oscars for? What, what documentaries, documentaries did they do? Um, so they Icarus is one of the ones they got an Oscar for. And I think, is it Cove? I don't know about Cove, but flipping Icarus. Oh, yeah. my God. <laughs> exactly. What yeah. a, well, that is mega. Yeah. That is a mega doc. That's the one about um, the the, uh, the doping, the doping scandal. Yeah, in Russia. Exactly. <sighs> yeah. So they uh, they also make uh, made Pavarotti recently with Ron Howard. Um, so, I mean, that's like dream come true for me. And the the producer at Diamond Docs, a guy called Michael Shevloff, is an absolute legend. He's become my kind of mentor, really, in the world of documentaries. Like he's forgotten more stuff than I'll probably ever learn. Hmm. Yeah. Mate, I, I was thinking about it before. You, I'm just going to go completely off topic, but it's what I. Mate, well, there's no point there. But uh, I was thinking about it earlier when, when we met. Went after Chris flipping Shirley <laughs> and his bloody disaster. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and piled in, and then you, you know, you give me a, a shout to RV in London, and uh, I noticed then, and now you like you really, you really. <laughs> Sounds silly. You're really calm, mate. You're like you're quite softly spoken, and uh, and you, you, it's quite uh, unique in the way you are like that. Um, and I was thinking earlier. I, I was I just what well, last question. Have you always been like that? Have you always been like this temperament? Because you're super switched on, obviously, mate. You've got a successful business, right? You're an intelligent individual, but then you got a background of just carnage. <laughs> <laughs> and but you're just this completely chilled out. Is this is this always been your temperament like this? Yeah, well, I mean, th th one of the major reasons I knew there was something not quite right with PTSD is because I I wasn't as calm as normal. I mean, I was probably the most calm person with complex PTSD ever, but no, this is this is me, ninety <laughs> percent of the time. And I get the more the more carnage I'm surrounded by, the more calm I get as well. Maybe that's what attracts me to it, but I don't know. That's an interesting observation. Yeah, that's an interesting one because I I um one of the things that which has sort of evolved in me over time is that when there is a catastrophe, I think I'm sure Mandy called it dissociation. I think it's just, I don't think, mate, I don't think it's a good thing, right? <laughs> but it's uh, just being able to switch off. Emotions get switched off and you sort of deal with it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I, yeah, I, I think, um, that's good in a way, but then at the same time, you're not dealing with it on, on the, it's on the surface level immediately. It causes all the dramas. Like, well, yeah, I'm sure that's called dissociation. I don't know. But I think a lot of people with our backgrounds are like that. A lot of, yeah. it just, I don't see how else you can, you can deal with repeated drama, you yeah. know, uh, threat to life without, uh, you, like, you couldn't do it and freak out every time. <laughs> no, <laughs> you'd only do it once if you freaked out. Um, yeah, I, th I think, uh, I mean, my way of dealing with stuff like that, when it when it's all gone really wrong, like when this shit has like flown through the, the fan and there's a mess on a wall, um, when 
that happens. You don't you don't think I'm on a mountain and I'm about to die. I mean, I, I did for a certain amount of time, but after that initial, oh, I've survived. Um, you then just you don't think about the big picture or getting off the mountain. It's just like, what do I need to do right now? It's like I've run out of water, so I'll make some water. And then it's like, what's going to make my life now? I'm at, now I'm going to survive. What's going to make my life slightly more comfortable? Coffee. Well, I have a coffee then. You just you know deal with each stage as it comes and don't yeah you know, as long as you look at the each tiny task in its entirety without getting swamped by the rest you're never going to get overwhelmed so you know like can i make water in this moment yes so well there's no need to panic then it'll be fine mate really <clears throat> really glad you brought that up actually i've just finished recently reading or well, audiobooking a book called a book called, I can't remember what it's called, <laughs> but it's by a guy called John Hodson, and I'm, I'm sure that's his name. John Hodson's ex RAF. Um, I'm sure he was a pilot at an accident. Long story short, though, he is that he runs the SEER school, he runs the escape and evasion, okay. and he runs a survival school. No, he runs a survival school for all of the British forces. Yeah, you heard of that. And, um, and one of the things, it, it, the, the book is fascinating. It's basically a, it, it's a book that's to, to give you, uh, it's to give you, you know, it's sort of life, le- it's, oh, here are life lessons you can learn from people who survived crazy stuff, as in stuff you should never survive. You know, people who like walk for 30 days through a desert with no water and all that. And you go, How yeah. did you survive that? Or cra- plane crashes or all, all that. But, book is so interesting mate it's so interesting for all those life lessons you can get from it i learned a lot from it like oh, for, for example for example um if you get anxious about something you know people get anxiety from time to time for a short shorter period of time you get anxious about something for whatever reason you've got an exam coming up i don't know you got well, i don't know um one of the things that can have an immediate effect on reducing your anxiety is going is, is eating or the act of eating Right, so pretend to chew, pretend to chew food, right? Because what it does is, it when you're going in, when you're in that sort of anxiety state, your body is in, going into the, uh, oh my god, we got a problem in the real world, right? Sh- shut everything down, so shut your digestive system off, close them all down. We don't need it now. We need immediate resources at the limbs and immediate, be able to like fight or flight, and through the act of chewing or or, or eating or actually eating. <clears throat> It tricks the body or forces the body back into activating the digestive system again. And so it brings it away from the, we've got a crisis going on and brings the anxiety down level. How, how simple is that? How yeah. simple is that? It's like flipping heck, brilliant. And, uh, but throughout it, the reason I brought it up is when you were talking there about you were on the mountain and on the mountain, well, you were on the mountain. Yeah. Flipping Everest. Uh, you're at camp one and you were, you had tasks to do, sim- focusing on simple things to achieve. One of the re- common themes among people who uh, the, su- the survivors, and when we're talking about there's teams or boats or crews of people, and some people have died in that 30, 60, 90 day nightmare. They died, they've, like sailors who have just deliberately drinking seawater to kill themselves and send themselves crazy. The difference between them and the survivors, one of the differences was the survivors were focusing on what could be done. What can we do? Yeah. You know, and is that simple, simple task? Because one of the things is it, it sort of gives you hope because this is one of the things it gives you hope because you've, uh, I mentioned this before and you will know this, I'm pretty sure it's but ach- achievements, setting yourself little tasks and achieving and achieving those tasks. It doesn't matter how small you are. It's one of the things that helped me out of um, when I was in a, a bad, a bad spot mentally and and it's recently a friend of mine who was in a real bad spot and uh and i went down to see him and then i came I, I, and i said to him when i was down there we were talking and i said to him look it sounds sounds silly but you need to set, set yourself a goal tomorrow and he was what do you mean so set yourself a goal he said well i get up and i, I go i walk my dog at half past six every morning and i said but you do that anyway right so but set yourself a goal that's really easy to achieve right easy to achieve it doesn't matter and you it has to be something you can do right so and, and the goal was in the morning was make your bed because i'd heard that from jordan peterson's book 12 years of life get up make make your bed yeah and um was that the first one it was it was it, it was the first one make his bed and then and then i rang her the next day i said did you, did you make your bed so yeah 
said, what are you, what's your task tomorrow? And he said, well, I, he said, oh, I'm going to, he basically his task for the next day was to eat healthy at lunch. So how are you going to do that? So I'm going to take my soup to work. I'm going to eat my soup. I'm not going to have any crap. I said, just don't forget to tin the soup in the morning, mate. <laughs> and he ate the soup the next day. And that, and we, that, we did that for four or five days. And he, uh, he messaged me. He said, <laughs> well, he said, uh, he, he, he saved my life. And that was it, like three or four days. <clears throat> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, mate. Um, so simple. Because yeah. he was in a really bad place. And then little tasks. What I was going to ask you before was, do you think it's, uh, do you think it's easier to cope with the, well, I think I've just answered it, but do you think it's easier to cope with um, catastrophe, disaster situations when there's, there's less stimulus? Is less stuff to distract you. It's easy to focus. Because I, the reason I ask is because I find that, um, I find that people these days, especially the younger generations, they're just bombarded with information all the time, constantly, and they're not, uh, my limited experience, they're just not great at dealing with dramas. They just can't think past the first level of solving a problem. Yeah, I think, um, I think if you're, so recently, uh, I say I'm calm all the time. Recently, I, th- I think with COVID and not traveling and not being able to work, I'm pretty confident I was depressed for for a couple of months. Um, and when when you're in that state, you take on all this like information from places you wouldn't normally take it on, or like someone says something to you and you you take it literally as opposed to thinking about it rationally. And when when you're not in a great place anyway then I think you take stimulus stimulus in a different way than if you are in a good in a good place. Um so I think if you're if you're constantly on your phone or looking at Facebook and there's all this crap coming up and you're you know you're you're dealing with your own like, you know not I mean dealing with an avalanche is pretty easy to do because you like it's like if you're at home and there is a lion in your living room you don't care about the fact you've not been able to pay the electricity bill because there's a lion lion in the living room like you've got to deal with that before you can worry about that and actually get you know if your brain is focused on being able to deal with those like life or death situations then often the normal stuff is much more difficult and i think um uh i think if you if you don't necessarily have those same life or death situations to deal with regularly, then it's easy to sort of, I don't know, to take, like I said, take all the um, the other kind of life issues in a different in a different sort of way. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Yeah, yeah, um, make, yeah, it does make sense. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult question actually. I don't, yeah. I don't know. I, I think, yeah, all the all the really big, the times when it's been life or death for me is like there is no distraction because it, none of it actually matters, um, and you just evacuate all of the all of that stuff. Doesn't matter anymore. It's like I don't care about any of that. I just care about this. Um, as as part of that, uh, as part of as part of that way of thinking, and the carryover into when you were suffering with your complex PTSD, did you find that that attitude that spilled over into normal life? So, in terms of nothing, nothing is relevant anymore. Nothing, nothing, um, nothing can possibly be a problem or worth getting stressed about, even bothering to think about. Because if, <laughs> unless I'm yeah. getting shot at a bomb that in the middle of an avalanche, you know, then it means nothing. Yeah, uh, that's, you've nailed it there. It's like, I mean, one of the things that I do struggle with is caring about normal day to day stuff. Because in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't, like, I feel really confident that I, I know what's important. Um, and the important stuff, I'll put everything into. Um, and the only thing that's really important is people, I think. Um, so I'll put everything into that and maintaining, you know, relationships that I care about and making sure that, you know, and, and for me to be able to do that, then obviously a big part of that is making sure that you're 
work is good and you're doing something you enjoy. So as long as I keep that going, then I can afford time to concentrate on making sure that, you know, people I care about are, you know, just, you know, the relationships are maintained. Um, so when I think with PTSD, it's, it's very easy to just not care about a huge amount of, of life that is actually quite important um, and to get annoyed by little things. So, you know, very good at dealing with an avalanche, but waiting in a queue to buy milk, like hating life. Shop, I fucking hate shopping. Um, and I get way more stressed shopping than I would in an avalanche. Like, there's, yeah. Um, so that, I mean, that's a, that's a bit of a strange one, but... Yeah, um, yeah. See, it's it's it's. Uh, the thing is, I think you you should it's it, you shouldn't get stressed about everything. Like, there is very no. little reason to get stressed about stuff, right? Yeah, but it doesn't mean the stuff doesn't matter. I mean, a classic one of that is the emotional side of things. Like, wow, oh, hurting someone's feelings. Get get a get a grip yourself. I and mean, it shouldn't be that. Yeah. <laughs> you're right. Hang on a minute. Was I in the wrong? Why the the feelings? Yeah, it's um. It's a hard one, I, and I think anyway. I mean, PTSD even catastrophe, catastrophe, God Almighty, <laughs> catastrophe aside, that can be a very easy channel of thinking to fall into just from having a uh, like a services background. I think hmm. because it just blows everything. We don't really give a shit about anything, and nothing. You know, you talk like yeah. nothing really matters unless it's military. Book the holiday next leave. Yeah, you're not going because you're on guard. You know, it's the same. Yeah. Nothing, <laughs> nothing matters yeah. apart from apart from what the machine the machine wants. Yeah. And I think when you're uh, when you're struggling with uh, mental health things, then you're not necessarily yourself. You're not thinking about things in the same way. So, like, it's easy to just like you said with the small tasks and routines. It's easy to fall out of that, um, and that's when you get you have real problems. I think so. Like when I was uh, depressed over the COVID thing and everything was. I thought my whole life was falling apart. Um, you, one day I woke up at like 6 a.m. and rather than go back to sleep for another three hours, I'd listened to some death metal, ran a half marathon, and I was good to go. And like instantly snapped out of the depression. And since then, I've been myself again. Um, so I think when, when you're struggling with mental health things, you're not necessarily thinking rationally, dealing with stuff in the right way. And it's very difficult to think rationally to make sure you do deal with it in the right way, which is when you need, like you did with your friend, to make sure that they actually achieved something that day. Um, and I think once once you do that, and once you get into that rhythm of achieving something, then you, you're onto a, onto a winner, and a, a really quick winner as well, I think. Yeah, the it's interesting. I mean, the, 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 I think when we are, when we are, when I have these conversations about mental health sort of things, it's very. I think I I I, I it's I, I always want to try and convey the fact. I'm not sort of the podcast, but conversations in general. I always want to try and want to convey the fact, like what we're talking about. It's this is normal everyday like stuff that I would I want my children to live and die by the die but live by this stuff, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, because the way I, again, I read another book, it was called Blueprint, and stuff, by a, a behavioral geneticist called Rob Plowman. I got to give him the podcast. He's flipping amazing, dude. You need to read that book, right? It's about how our, it's how our, how our gen, genes affect our behavior, right? Um, it's it, nature versus nurture, yeah. Um, and one of the things he was he, he, he's talking about uh, the m mental health. And he said, you know, we try and stick, we try and stick labels against everything, and it's useful to do in some occasions. And other reasons, it's like a money driven and big farm and all this, right? But he's saying, it you can look at it just broadly uh, on your mental health on a big scale. Zero being you, that's you topping yourself. Zero, you know, and a hundred percent being I'm good to go, motherfuckers, <laughs> right? So everyone has a, a everyone has like a. We, we sort of all float, my, like my floating about happy, like c content, no major issues could be a 60 or a 70 on that scale, right? And that, and everyone has a different point on it. And, and again, I'm generalizing in the scale because you've got all sorts of stuff. You got, you know, you got emotional happiness. You got, it, it's all the, um, 
what do you call it? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You got all, and potentially each one has a different scale, right? But generally speaking, I, let's say I'm floating about in the 70. Because of my, my past and what I've learned and been taught and my own exper- emotional experiences, I'm, I'm now able to more quickly identify when I'm falling away from 70 and going, creeping down, 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 right? And the further I get away from 70, the faster that decline becomes, okay? And and uh, and like you were saying, so you, my, my mate, I need a name to that. My mate who I said, you know, I said, set yourself a task every day. I made sh- I made the point of saying to him, this isn't about, this isn't, this isn't the fix, right? But what, what setting yourself a little goal and achieving it does is what it, it, you he was at zero or one, okay? This is how bad he was on that scale. And it's about, you set yourself a little task and every little achievement you do, it bumps you up a notch. So you're going from, you're not on the one anymore, you're on five, right? When you're, you're going a bit higher on the scale. When you're a bit higher on the scale, it gives you a different perspective on the problems or the issues that you're facing mentally. You get a slightly different perspective. You feel slightly less crap. And so you're slightly better um, equipped to take yourself up to the next stage, you know? And like you were saying, Achievements are really quick wins. Even now, like I even practicing that, achievements are really quick wins. If I'm super stressed, and it happens less now, but if I get super, super, super stressed and like anxiety hits me or something like that, I can, one, I know why it's happening. I go, ah, I haven't done fizz for flipping two weeks, for example. And that's, yeah. that's one, that is just one thing. I can easily identify that. Or I've been drinking too much recently. That's another thing. Or my diet's been crap. It's another thing. But I can just see those in a quick game. So I'll do a quick win. I'll go, I'll, I'll make myself get into some fizz. Not because that's going to fix everything, but it's going to put me in a better mind state. And then guaranteed, I go out and do a run, you know, or swimming or whatever. Guaranteed, I am sailing through life for the next four yeah. weeks because I'll, keep up the fitness i'll be making better decisions i'll be dealing with stress much better and that's what it's about it applies to everyone it's like people seem it seems to be just the accepted norm that it's like an underlying level of stress and anxiety or disappoint disappointment or discontentment it doesn't have you don't have to have that no. you don't don't there's stuff that's causing it and you can bloody fix it you yeah. can fix it you absolutely you can't make yourself be no one is 100 percent happy all the time from the millionaires down to the flipping tramps in the street right no one is right yeah. but what you do it yourself is to try and keep you as good as you can be just by just by just by doing those simple things what's more you'll live longer you'll be yeah. happier you'll you're more likely to live longer which means you're going to be more around you're going to be around longer for your kids for your loved ones for your friends you're going to have more an impact in your life more of an impact in society i don't mean like a grand way like said bill gates but you, Good people in society are good for society. <laughs> yeah. Bad people are not, right? Ill people are not. You know, it's, that's, I'm not saying ill people are bad people, but they're just not. You know, the point I'm making is well, these things we talk about, uh, these fixes <coughs> in inverted commas, man, anyone use them. And anyone, they're there for everyone. Having a shit day, having a crap day, go for a walk. Go on. Don't normally do it, go for a walk. Yeah. Set yourself a little task. Eat, eat a bit better. Give yourself a healthy meal tonight. You don't have to have a healthy meal every day of your life, but have one tonight, you'll feel better for it. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you don't like the taste, you'll be like, I had a healthy meal. <laughs> <laughs> it's true though. People yeah. don't, it's, I, I, I re, it's one of those things I wish you could just shout it from the rooftops and go, yeah, look at all this stuff. We can, you know, we know all this stuff. Just take it and, you know, take these tools on board. Just think about, think more about your, how you feel emotionally. Don't just pay lip service to it. Yeah. Just, just think, take, okay, you feel shit. Okay, that's stage one. Now drill down to the next stage. Why? What reason? Then drill down to the next stage. You will get to a root cause or yeah. whatever it is. One of the root causes and fucking fix it. And then enjoy the next day. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And it, I think uh, from speaking to people that have done ultra marathons and things, like they, uh, and Everest and like other ridiculous things, um, you have to go through this check, particularly on Everest, actually, you have to go through this mental checklist of like, okay, I've been walking for half an hour. Like, yeah, and you sort of do a mental scan of your body. So it's like, do uh, do my hands, like, can I feel my hands? Can I feel my feet? Can I, you know, am I really tired? Am I breathing too hard? What's my heart rate like? And you go through all these, like, this checklist of stuff to check that you are actually good to, to keep going. Um, I think mentally we should be doing that as well. Where you just 
take a stop each like take a pause and actually work out like are you okay you know how how do you feel how did you feel that morning like have you is there something that you've not done today that you would normally do did you like not make the bed when you normally would make the bed or whatever it might be i think we probably we should i think people should take time to learn about themselves more and um also exactly what you said just the just thing is it's really hard it. i think it's really hard to believe in what to understand what we're saying the value of it and, and unless you've unless you've had to have a really really bad time to see the value mm. you know um uh i mean the, the what it becomes i think is and this is you know from my mate we're, all of my mates who have issues it's not just like one same with, the same with you i'm sure yeah uh, again this is just people people have people love they're on that they're on that scale somewhere yeah. i'm being careful not to say spectrum right they're on, they're on that scale somewhere right and um, but what it becomes for me definitely i am becoming more and more uh, uh, pr- proactive and aware than reactive okay so um i mean i, I yeah i this began i take a break away i just, i ran myself to the ground for 10 days and but i knew 10 days ago i knew because i knew it was coming up for 10 i had I, there's a load of stuff coming up over the next 10 days and I, I think I might have mentioned to her, Mrs., uh, about some of it. I knew it was coming. And I could, at that point, I could have done some mitigation to change some of the stuff that was upcoming in the next 10 days. And I didn't. I didn't. And then ten, and then after that 10 days, which was this weekend, well, um, yeah, uh, early, early this weekend, man, I was completely burnt out. I made some poor decisions. It's like, oh, my God. And I, you know, I, I hate myself for it. I thought I was so stupid. I knew I was knew that was coming. But yeah. do you know what that is? That is much better than being t- ten days than six months of going down the pan and not realizing that until you, you know, you got a, a, a bunch of pills you want to swallow, or you, you know, you're going to flip and blow your head off because that that's 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 where it gets to. You just you, you see things quicker, you deal with it quicker, mm. or even reactively. Unfortunately, reactively, but like this weekend but i know really quick right let's turn this around because this is gonna go pizza like i said you yeah. go off, you start going off the edge of that cliff uh wrong analogy for, uh, you yeah. start going you know going creeping over the edge of a of a hill towards the cliff and the longer you leave it the faster you you descend down you you know mate it's uh yeah and you i think we everyone now is so busy and you're kind of i think Actually, Instagram and social media, Instagram particularly, but social media is really terrible when you, you're you having a really shit time and then there's people that are posting photos of like in the film industry, like this happens a lot where, you know, people will post photos of them on a shoot and you're like, I've not done a shoot in a month. Why are they shooting? And I, what's wrong with me? And of course, that's a photo that they took six months ago and they're just, I mean, I, I'm guilty of it. I do all the time. Um, actually I don't do it all the time but occasionally I'll do it um, and so you yeah I think I think it just gives you a kind of a false impression of what you what you should be doing and how how many times in our lives really if you if you stop for an hour like what is going to be the impact of that if you're completely honest you know if you cancel a meeting and say right I'm going to have an hour for myself like what's the impact of of that on your on your life it's probably you know it's probably going to have zero impact on your career or your future or whatever but it will have a massive impact positive impact on you personally to be able to like you know give yourself a bit of time and work out do you, what you should be doing do you, do you have trouble do you did you have you had trouble doing that sort of relaxing taking an hour and seeing the benefit of being unproductive um i'm really bad at it actually like kind of preaching what i don't practice um it's a it's a yeah. lesson it's a it's something same year and it's so my missus pulls a flipping hair out at it i'm always trying to, you know, i've got to keep myself busy constantly and i don't know where that comes i have a feeling i know where it comes from but but i i over the last sort of year i've realized the, um the the benefit in doing absolutely bugger all Absolutely, bugger all. See that yeah. you might have seen that I got a little Nokia up there. So, like, fr- so Saturday morning, when I, you know, when I realised, oh my god, I am absolutely fried. SIM card came out with my 
Huawei didn't want yeah. trying to listen to me in the weekend. I put it into a Nokia. I was like, right, that's it, done. I, I, I didn't even say anything. didn't tell anyone, right? Because yeah. I, I just put it in a Nokia. People could still phone me or text me. I've got kids as well. So they didn't get hold of me as well. And uh, I, on a Saturday, my God, uh, it was easier to chill because my phone, I did not. And I'm not, don't get me wrong, right? I am not someone who sits there and does the flicking finger through Instagram thing yeah. constantly, right? I'm not someone who does a lot. I use, for the most part, I use social media f- functionally. Podcasts and stuff like that, for the most part. Let's have a drink and things are going to move. Yeah. But, uh, but, so, but if the phone's there, I'm on it. I, like, it's one of those, it was one less thing to keep me busy with. To keep me occupied. So that went off. And I, I found, I watched, one of the things I can't do, Tom, is I struggle to maintain focus to watch a film. If I'm on my own. Uh, it is, uh, it's like not going to happen. If I'm with yeah. the missus or I'm with the kids watching something, for some reason I can do it and sit there and chill like that. I'm on my own, ain't happening. It's almost, I think, uh, I'm just being lazy. I'm not doing anything. I'm not achieving anything. Here. On the weekend, because I, I had a Nokia, and my phone was off. It wasn't up there. I tried to keep away from my laptop. Yeah. Quite out a couple of times to do some bits and bobs. But I watched two or three films on Saturday. I just did nothing. Two or three films. It was like, I was like, flipping heck. That's just like, because I, yeah. I took the SIM card out of my smartphone. <laughs> but I was like, it was, I was like, this is brilliant. I, was, I, was, I actually enjoyed it. Yeah. I watched Some of All Fears. Never seen it. What a brilliant film. <laughs> I don't think I've seen that it. Proper old, that very brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, Again, it's just little things that, that, oh, God, we're so, we are so not naive. We're so ignorant in society of, um, our mental and physical well-being and how important it is and how much you can impact the quality of your life. You know, I shudder to think how many people get to the end of life and they just like, man, what, what, what did I get? What did I find that a quality life? Yeah. You know, and that is different for different people. For some people, it's, you know, doing good in the community. For other people, it's just being a good parent. You know, other people, it's, it turns out and being, making billions and billions and billions and billions and, yeah, you know, whatever. But I think it, I should, we, we owe it to ourselves to try and give us the best shot at being content when we're on death's door, you know. Um, but we're so ignorant with it now. One of the things I, I, I thought was mega with, uh, with Boris recently, with Boris Johnson was, they have advocating the fitness. I can't remember when a PM did that. Like he, like he has. They've paid yeah. it lip service in the past, but he's saying, "I'm going. I am make not go out and keep. But I am making an effort." And he's no slim kid, right? You know, he's got a life of indulgence behind him, but he's getting out there and sort of setting that tone. It's flipping brilliant. It's flipping brilliant. And the only reason I think it's brilliant is because I know the benefits of getting out and being physically active, even just walking, man. Yeah, you know. Um, I think so. My major so. Uh, after getting over, well, dealing with the PTSD and everything else, my major take home point of everything I did on, on Mert and Everest and all the other stuff is that it can all be over so quickly that you have to, you should really sort of, you know, not try and live for the moment and spend every waking second, you know, doing this or doing that because then you just burn out and you get burnt out and you don't appreciate stuff, but just find, you know, just understand that it can be done before you know it. And you want to make sure that you don't feel like you've wasted your whole life. And, you know, I've met someone recently that is like, I would give up any kind of any film or any job um, to be able to do something. I mean, I'm not going to give up my, job or career or anything but like you know to spend more time with with them i would sacrifice uh, a lot more other stuff because like for me like i said before people are the most important thing and the only thing that really makes me feel content is by doing stuff with someone that i really want to do it with um and that's you know after picking up probably three or four hundred casualties on that that's the one thing that i really sort of took away from it all Mm. Yeah, uh, it, I used to. Uh, I, th- I think that's what it is for me with the with the having to keep busy all the time. Yeah, I think it's. Um, and this is the lesson I'm learning. Uh, so I've been at it for years, and I think it is that part. The you know, part of it is that man, 
you're here. Like, let's not waste it. Yeah. Let's 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 get let's get busy, buddy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But then I think uh, I I don't know why I didn't decide to. But but what I'm learning now is that you can be productive by not being productive kind of thing it's, it's like where, where what it, again it's back to that what do i want in life what what do i see as living my life properly and it's it's not necessarily flipping well it's not doing lots of material filling my time up with lots of material things you know like um, volunteer stuff and business ideas and all that, that it's not it's not there's there's stuff outside of that for example it's downtime you know it's that giving yourself a break because it's valuing that because because I am a better person, you know, and I, <clears throat> I gave some thought last year to like what, what that question of what's the meaning of life, what's the point of it, you know, what, what, and it goes back to I was thinking about what, what do I want to have done at the end, if I were there on my deathbed and they go, what do you reckon, you, how would your life, what do you think your life was, it worth it, kind of thing, what do you, what do I want to have achieved, and I think it's simp for me, I think it's just simply, have you been a good person? And you can't be a good person all of the time, but you can flip and well try, you know, and I definitely haven't been a good person in the past sometimes. Um, but I think that's where it is. Just be a good person. And I think with that, for me anyway, and that gives me so much free reign in what I want, what I can do day to day. Yeah. It's not make a million pounds or, you know, 10 million or X amount of money. It's not have a successful business, for example. It's simply just be good. Just be a good thing. You know, be someone respected. It just, yeah. and that could be by one person or by flipping millions. You know, and uh, it gives me free reign. So if I want to sit down and slouch in front of the TV and eat some eat some popcorn and Pringles, I can do. Because <laughs> I'll be happier and more relaxed the next day with my missus or my kids and I'm being a good person. Why are you a yeah. good person? I've been a slob yesterday, that's why. <laughs> no, but you see what I mean? Yeah. I'm going a bit deep there, but yeah, it's... Uh, it's it's mad. It, 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 it's it's the the mental health thing. Understanding your 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 brain and your emotions. It's, it's so complex and so it's just crazy. And so the sim the sim the more simple you can make it, the better. Like you were saying, you know, people need to understand themselves. Uh, chip away. You identify a, a feeling. Why is it there? Okay. Now why is that? Why is that reason there? Let's yeah. get rid of it. Let's eliminate that. And just. Uh, be fucking happy, man. There's so many people are just in clip, in yeah, absolute clip, and I mean, a lot of them don't even realise it. They don't, they don't chip away. They don't look, try and look between the below the first level of unhappiness. You know? Yeah, uh, and you know, everyone feels shit every now and then. Just have to work out how to make yourself feel a tiny bit better. Especially those gingers, mate. All the time, <laughs> all of the time. <laughs> you're you're strawberry blonder. Uh, that was blonde. The rest, <laughs> pretty ginger. <laughs> what's um, what's next for dust off? Um, so uh, Kenya's the next thing. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's uh, three weeks in Kenya, two weeks uh, shooting with the Rangers, um, and then after that, I'm hoping there'll be a trip to Nepal, which will be a month long if it happens. Um, kind of COVID dependent at the moment. Everest again. Uh, same region, but not not Everest. I am supposed to go back to Everest uh, either next year or the or the year after, but yeah, we'll see. Um, and then there's the Mozambique thing, which is Diamond Docks. That'll be edited in LA. So um, from Thursday, I might be out of the country for three months, kind of aiming for three months. But yeah, we'll see. We'll see what, what crops up. Yeah. Well, mate, it's been a... Uh, in fact, is there anything we haven't mentioned that you want to mention? No. How um, do people find your website? Dust uh, off. Yeah, dustofffilms.com. Nice and simple. Yeah. And Instagram. You've got a cool Instagram. Uh, so there is there is a Dust Off Films Instagram, but I'm really bad at keeping that up to date. Oh. So mine is at Martinson, which I don't know if I'm going to spell it on there. <laughs> <laughs> Dust Off Films, do that. <laughs> if, you, if you find the Dust Off Films Instagram, follow that and then... It should be pretty obvious. I'll I'll put my actual Instagram in the Dust Off Films Instagram. I'll, I'll tag it in anything. Yeah, mate, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, good luck with Kenya. Good luck with Mozambique and uh, and uh, and oh yeah, Diamond Docks. And we'll do it when you get back. Get back on when you get back. So get back on when you get back. Yeah, I'd love the to. Podcast. Oh, yeah. shout out to Chris Shirley for the introduction. Oh yeah, yeah. I in the. Accidental introduction when he smashed his leg up in Italy. He's hobbling around pretty 
pretty quickly now. Boot next, mate. Yeah. Boot next. Almost as bad as average. No joke. <laughs> mate, Jen, oh, been a pleasure. Good luck. Cheers. Cheers, bud.